This us. conference will now be recorded. I'm going to go to my notes. So a little bit of, it's funny, a little bit of background, but I've, I've said a lot already, but like, um, I see that there is a huge um, a need for us to, to really learn how to, it's not that we don't know how to do this, but I think it's time for us to know the deeper layers of revelation from the most high of what praying is really about. And on top of that, why are there certain things in the scripture that you can only win from or you can only overcome from by prayer and fasting? So, so today, what I really want to bring before you are seven points. Um, I'm happy to share my notes so you don't need to, you know, I'm happy to share my notes to you so that you can also venture off in studying with me. Because a lot of what I'm going to share are simply to get us to wonder, get us to be curious. Because without curiosity, how, how curiosity is something that is needed before you can learn, right? Like one can just sit and just listen to something but not penetrate the teaching, you know, sort of like you're wearing a raincoat and it, you're allowing rain from above, but you're not really getting wet. You know, the scripture likens the teaching of the most high as if it's rain. Let Moshe says that, let my teaching be as the rain that drops, right? So, but we have to be curious. And when we're curious as to how the rain feels like, we would take off the, the raincoat so we can actually get wet, right? We can actually feel what the rain feels like. So that's my point. Um, so uh, what I want to do is just to get us to be curious about some of these things that's written in the word. Um, also, I know that- I have that... a question real quick. Yes. Go ahead. Sister. So what you just said there was very beautiful. So what came to my mind is uh, being fully immersed in the word. Mm, right? I love it. Because, because we- when we we see a, okay so like we're walking and we see a puddle of um water you know we can decide and choose like whether to step around it or step in it and get our feet wet yes so that right. was thank you absolutely sister i love the connection that is what baptizo baptism is baptizo it is to fully immerse right but we have to see that the Mashiach, what he says, or John says, I came to baptize by water, right? But then he is going to come and baptize us in spirit and fire. Think about that for a second. And remember what I just said, spirit, you, can, it's so, you cannot comprehend spirit. You cannot see it. So, you know, the, the, the lesson seems to be that it is the same thing it behaves the same as water. But why is it spirit? Because water, if you look at the tabernacle, if we're going to study the tabernacle together, you one of the things that the priests do, you know, when they enter is they wash their hands, they wash their feet. You know, there's that aspect of washing, you know, there's and they immerse in, in the brazen uh, layer, like that bowl, I forget the term right now. But we're, we're going to get to that point. But then, you know, we don't stop there, right? So you, the writer of Hebrews talk about, you know, we have to um, go on to perfection or we have to go on to like meteor stuff. We can't get stuck with like baby doctrine. Like, you know, like, um, you know, like, and he refers to baptism as one of them, right? If I, if my memory serves me right. So my point is there is something that's hidden in the word, uh, concealed in the word that is really, um, you know, it is the glory of Yah to hide or to conceal things, right? It is the glory of King to search those things, right? So that's what we're doing. This is a Malki Zadik approach to study, right? So, uh, you know, the spirit and fire now has something to do with our soul realm and our spirit realm. 
So fire, you know, if you look at fire, what is one of the most combustible things that you can think of when it's, um, you know, when it's reacted in a proper way is hydrogen. Hydrogen is really, the sun is a ginormous hydrogen, a ball of hydrogen. But hydrogen as well as water in it. Like, you know, if you, that's how water is formed, right? Hydrogen and oxygen, right? So point being is um, there is more to just the water baptism. And, and we know that there's a spirit in fire. And so if you look at the menorah that we have in front of our screen here, um, we're going to refer to this a lot. But if you want to understand spirit, right? There is also layers of approach um, to when it comes to spiritual things, because Isaiah 11, 1, you know, it really, this is a description of, of the spirit, because it says that the, you know, that the spirit of, you know, uh, uh, there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, a branch shall grow out of his roots, the ruach, the spirit of Yahuwah shall rest upon him. And then there's, you know, there's the spirit of wisdom. And understanding, counsel, might, um, knowledge, and reverence of Yahuwah. But you got to see this as well as these little branches when they get lit, you know, when there's oil, when there's, you know, when you light it with fire with in the fuel, it turns up, it, it burns, it becomes a source of light, right? So, um, that's why this particular furniture in the tabernacle is found in the holy place. And in the holy place, it's not really designed with windows. You know, like there is, um, according to Andrew's, um, what he has found is that there is an optional uh, covering at the very top that you can take on and off, maybe for, for, um, for air purposes, circulation or something like that. But in the holy place, it is designed to be the light source, the only light source. So if you look at it, before you enter the holy place, you're, you're doing business in the outer court, right? In the courtyard. The courtyard is an open space. I mean, there's no, the, the source of light is the sun and the moon, if you think about it. Or, or you know, there's that aspect of sun that is shining in the outer court okay now when you enter into the holy place you're no longer under the sun your source of light is the menorah right so point being is it's very consistent with the garden story right or or if you're not familiar if you haven't noticed that in the garden there's no sun in the garden the garden is a you know it's an inter it's a different dimension it is a higher dimension um, it is a place where heaven and earth has come together. It's heaven, literally on earth. So if you look at Revelation, Revelation 22, 23, you're going to notice it says there is no need for sun in the new Jerusalem, right? So the new Jerusalem is simply a restored back, a restored Garden of Eden. So the point is, again, our Mashiach or Yahuwah is giving us a hint of what to expect what is what is it like in the in the new jerusalem what's the kingdom of yah going to be like and we can see glimpses of that in in the tabernacle and in the furniture of the tabernacle okay but since um really my 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 hope is that we would really come to a deeper appreciation of what prayer is like Okay, because um, even before you get to the holy place, there are a number of uh, I don't want, like I don't want to processes or steps or progression, progressive steps before you can even be uh, worthy to enter into the holy place, right? Like you'd have to go through the things that's happening in the, the you know, first of all, you have to go through the court. And then I thought, Sister Stephanie, you mentioned that Yahusha himself, he, uh, you know, they crucified him outside, right? Like it, it's in just like uh, the red heifer. Yes, I think it was in Exodus 29, oh, verse like 10 through 14. Right. 
So all of that stuff, there's we have to glean from that. What's the purpose of that stuff? But what I want to point out is this, and this is sort of because we're in a season where we really um, we're kind of like a light. We need to learn how Elijah did it and and walk in it because as this bride of Mashiach, as the set apart people, uh, we're going to enter a time and season where the supernatural needs it not needs, but it's going to manifest is my point. That's what's written in Revelation, right? So look at this, right? James 5.16, the effective prayer or fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, okay? So if you look at the, the Greek word of effective fervent, okay? Effective fervent is the word energeo. What does that <laughs> sound like to you? Energy, energy, right? Energy. Energy. See, we, we don't think of it like that. So the effective, fervent prayer or the energy. Okay, let's break it down further. You know, this is, you're going to see me refer to a lot when it comes to etymology things. Like I like to break down words. And what I mean by this is, I, I this is just, this not even deep, uh, uh, deep as far as going into paleo or the ancient text. This is just going into the Greek of things. So look at the word energy broken down into two, right? Two little subwords. One is en and ergon. So en is in, by, with. So in. So in other words, this effective, fervent manner of praying comes from within, right? And it comes by and it's with. So think about the triune being, spirit, soul, body. Uh, Yahuwah, we need to be, we are, we are given this earthen vessels, right? And we know that we're going to get an incorruptible vessel, but we are designed to uh, carry his image, his energy, you know, in this earthen vessel. So we are to be set apart. We are to be um, you know, somewhere it says, may we be um, uh, fit, a fit vessel for the master's use. So that's, you know, and also the word ergon. That's interesting. Ergon, I don't know if you've heard of the word term ergonomics, right? So it has something to do with employment. You know, this is some term that is used uh, in the business world when they're trying to, you know, knit together or equipments that are ergonomically like something that's ergonomic anyway the point of that is that also means that which anyone is occupied so in other words the effective fervent prayer right of a righteous man so first of all this man has to be in found in righteousness this man has to be standing in the righteousness of mashiach okay and when you are found standing in the righteousness of, of Yahuwah, right, which is inside the court, think about it, in, you know, it, you're not outside the court. When we're talking the tabernacle, you're in the court at least. Now you're standing in the righteousness of Mashiach, right? When, when you do that, there is this energy, there is this source of light, this fire, this spirit that will occupy this earthly vessel that we have does that make sense and and can i right? also you um i think that um are you guys familiar with organ or organite Ooh, go ahead um i forget who what his name who developed it rich white something um but anyway it's a collection of crystals um that is used mm. to her negative energy but in some yes. way it also harnesses energy so i think that that word probably also comes from this this word ergon wow um, makes sense i love that i'm gonna have to look into that ergon can you type that into the chat just so i know the spelling sure. yeah absolutely um, so <laughs> to me it is you know the the adam and eve were prior to the fall they were bright beings thank you they were light beings but after the fall 
right? The, because of the disobedience of the soul of Eve, and once again, not once again, sorry, we're going to actually get into, um, we, we don't want to look at that in a negative light, okay? Because that was all in the plan. You know, nothing catches Yahuwah by surprise. That had to happen, okay? Eve had to have that happen so that she can be a recipient of mercy. Okay, without that happening, there wouldn't be mercy. And if there's no mercy, truth wouldn't manifest. So how does truth manifest about who Yahuwah, one of his nature, one of his characteristic about being a merciful creator, someone has to receive that. Okay, so just I'm just going to throw it out there. So in order for um, consciousness to increase it's almost like you need to you need to have entropy first if you think about it how would you know that he is a solver of problem if there's no problem to begin with right so everything is designed for us to learn okay what his purposes are from the very beginning and it's actually a beautiful story right so going back to prayer um, we all know that there, there's power when it comes to words, right? Death and life is in the power of the tongue. So we have to also understand that the enemy, right, knows that. In fact, the enemy probably knows that more than we do, right? Um, it, it's no, um, the reason why they are, they're, you know, the word cunning, the serpent is a cunning creature. Right, that that word is something not to gloss over with. Right, there's something to that effect that these these uh, the, the kingdom of darkness knows what they're doing. So to cast a spell, one must spell. Okay. So if you look at King James, and I think we're all on the same agreement here that um, that there is a need for us to study the word because we cannot just take the English surface level as it is, because um, there is a purposeful hiding or, or misleading that the authors of, like, let's just start with King James have done. And I'm just gonna propose this idea, okay? So the word pray is very similar to the word P-R-E-Y, okay? So P-R-A-Y and P-R-E-Y, right? Pray comes from prayer based on Latin, prayer dairy, which means to seize as plunder. Okay, so in other words, thief, you know, you're being seized as, a, as an object to be stolen, right? If I'm saying that right. And we know who the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. We know who that is, okay? Now let's look at the word pray, P-R-A-Y. That comes from a Latin called uh, precare or precary entreat, earnest request, entreaty, petition, or ask earnestly. Okay, so pray really came from the word ask earnestly, which makes a lot of sense because Matthew 7, you know, and Luke 11, this is how, you know, this follows the model of prayer right? That, that our Yahusha teaches us. So I say to you, ask. You see, if you, you ask is a, is a, makes up the word, the letters A-S-K. So if you look at it, ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. The K stands for knock and it will be open. So my point is just, we just got to be aware of it. I'm not saying don't use the word pray, but just know how there, there is a sinister, seemingly unobvious way of, I wonder what the intent is of whoever wrote, um, you know, was moved to write it in this manner, English, because English is a dumbed down language, right? We have to understand that. So let's look at the word pray in Greek, okay? So the word pray in Greek is uh, pro se kome. Forgive me if I'm saying that wrong, but pros, Let's break it down into the, what the word is made up of. Pros means to the advantage. All right, authority, salvation, yep, yep. Uh, to the advantage of, to be near or before. 
So that's what pros means, okay? Now, if you look at what, what does that remind you of? To the advantage of panim to panim with the most high, right? And we, we know that that started in the garden with Adam when the most high breathed the breath of life into his face. That is the breath there is nashama. Okay, we're going to talk more about that later on, about the nashama and how that's going to work into this. But now we think of Moshe. His skin, his, the face of Moshe shone while he was talking with Yahuwah, right? And we, we know in Leviticus and elsewhere, it says, Yahuwah make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. So my point, this pro seems to have something to do with being so near to our father, near to him, that we are in an advantage of, we are before him. And, you know, First Chronicles 16, 11 says that we are to look to him and his strength. We are to seek his face always. Okay, so in the word, in the Greek word, pray, prosekomoe, we see that, that hints of that, okay? And then, you know, we all know about the transfiguration of the Messiah where he, his clothes became shining and so forth. So now let's look at the other part of the word pray in Greek, okay? It's yukome, and that means to wish or to will, okay? Now think of um, the, the model prayer that our Messiah wanted us to pray. He says, may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's an interesting statement because if Yahusha is asking us to pray that way, that means that his will is not always being done. We have to recognize that. And this is why we are being encouraged by him to pray in this manner, okay? But we have to ask, what is his will? What is the Father's will when it comes to prayer? And that's what we're going to break down. It's so, it's a lot of details, but it's really simple, okay? But we have to get down to the details so we can have a true appreciation of how it works. But we have this little clue that uh, Paul talks about in First Thessalonians, because we've all prayed, you know, we have um, an intuitive, we have this desire to speak to our maker. So we've all prayed in the past. But one thing that we have to be reminded of is First Thessalonians 5, 16, 18, where it says, rejoice always, pray or ask earnestly without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. Look at that. For this is the will of Yah in Mashiach, Yahusha, for us. So, you know, we have to see that when we ask earnestly, you know, with all our heart, and because we know we're asking and declaring what the, the will of the Father is, once we do that, remember, words are powerful what's left to do or what has to be a part of the equation, a part of the mannerism of prayer is the rejoicing and to give thanks because that rejoicing or being thankful is basically telling your heart that you've already received it. And by the fact that you're being thankful, even though it hasn't manifested in the physical, by doing that and continually giving thanks in all circumstances, what you're doing is just like how the heart does. When what the heart does is it creates a very powerful electromagnetic field, frequency, a biofield. And what that means is that it draws. You know, when you look at a magnet, it draws. So whatever it is that we're asking the Father in His will and in His name, and we're going to talk about what that means, and we simply rejoice and we give thanks. We're telling, we're putting our heart in such a, a state of gratitude that it is in a state of expectation. And because you're expecting it, the more you expect it, just watch and see, it will come to pass, okay? But we have to understand how we're gonna battle some of the, uh, the things that we battle with, like our thought process. You know, and, and we have to understand why we battle with those thought process that seems to bring doubt and unbelief, okay? So um, I, I just wanted to, <clears throat> excuse me, to share please. a verse 
maybe that you have that goes already with that but in um yes. mark 11 um 24 because of yes. this i say to you whatever you ask when you pray believe that you receive them and you shall have them hallelujah see i love that thank you that is very timely and we have to understand why right and we, when we read the that part in the scripture how is this possible like why is this you know and it's not that you don't have faith okay you know asking so if you look at the word faith it means pistis pistis in uh is a greek word for strong conviction so for you to be strongly convinced you have to be studying and knowing and asking the questions what happens is you know and we see this a lot in the church unfortunately um they're so busy with the agenda that the church is carrying about growing you know the building funds and all all that stuff that all these young kids they have questions you know and even if they ask they're trained not to ask whether they say you know just accept it the way it is that it is what it is and so what happens is that it's the the child is left wondering right the the, the question remains and then unfortunately if that's not addressed in the right proper context of the word then guess who's going to address that in the future right new age or whatever that's out there that is going to sound very good it's going to sound that it makes sense right so then these young people are going to get drawn towards that and they're going to do away with you know not even look at the word anymore right so i guess you know so and and feel free to just chime in okay um let's look at the word pray in hebrew okay in hebrew it gets even more interesting it's palal okay palal which literally means to speak in authority or speak to authority and the pal that is a if you look at that in the picture uh, pictograph it's like a picture of a mouse you know as when it comes to speaking and the picture of a staff that has to do with authority okay and another interesting thing about pal, it also has the meaning fall. And we're gonna get back to that, but that's a really interesting point there because palal then literally means to fall down to the ground in the presence of one in authority to plead a cause, okay? And I have the um, reference here and I can, I'll be happy to share that with you as well. But so all of that stuff, Okay, to, to really now bring before you the seven things that I'm going to propose for us to study. Okay, and then when we get back together next week, y'all willing, right? I'd love to compare notes, right? So when it comes to asking earnestly, okay, is there a difference when we ask or pray in the spirit versus praying in the soul or flesh and blood? Okay, so what I'm saying is, is, uh, is there a key difference? And we, do we, we are instructed to worship the Most High in spirit and in truth. We are instructed to pray in the spirit. I don't know if I read that, but I have a verse that's coming up that talks about that as well. So we have to look at a couple of examples for us to understand that, okay? And probably one of the, one one thing that came to mind when I was um, meditating on this is the story of Job. Okay, it, I, I don't know if you you can think of anyone else that is deserving of uh, being um, meeting with and praying together with than what happened to Job, right? So if if you think of us and you know, circumstance comes and we are in need, we are in trouble, we are um, in desperate need for anything, we we ask for prayer. And, and that's a, you know, that's a good thing, right? That is something that is naturally something that we are designed to do. Because we know that where two or three are in our midst, you know, like all these, the power of community, right? But I guess what I'm saying is, um, what i'm proposing is for us to understand the difference between spirit and soul or flesh and blood praying is looking at the story of job where when all of this came to him remember 
we are reading Job from a perspective of already knowing that he was being tested. Okay, because we get privy to the beginning of the chapter where we see a conversation between the creator and a Satan, right? Job didn't know this, nor did his friends. So because they're not privy to this, we can see the reactions of, of what our human nature is, right? So, but, but one thing that stru struck me that we all have to learn how to do is this. When they heard, and we're talking about the three friends of Job, okay? When they heard all of the adversity that had come upon Job, this is Job 2, 11, okay? What they do is they purposely made an appointment together to come and mourn with him and comfort him, okay? They, they saw him, they didn't even recognize him, as you can imagine, and they cried with him, okay? They felt such, they felt what he was feeling, right? Uh, and that's how, that's what community does, right? When, when we're, it's not quite the same when we're meeting, um, like when the quarantine and all that stuff, this is what they're trying to, to take away from us, is this ability for us to feel one another, okay? But point is, look what the friends of Job did. Because when you and I, when we're asking for prayer or when we hear someone asking for prayer, <laughs> The first tendency is for us to, okay, let's get on it. Let's sit down. Let's, you know, let's, okay. But we fail to recognize that, um, it, do I have the discernment of the spirit? Do I have the, the word from Yahuwah to pray over this situation? Okay. So one of the things that Job's friends recognized was they didn't. So what they did was they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights. No one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his grief was very great. You see, seven days. So my question is, can we do that? Think about that. Can we actually be still, not say a word? And there's a reason why. Okay, there's a reason why when, and I was talking to Sister Florence about this, it's part of the, the 40 days that I was looking to study together with, right? This idea of silence fasting, right? Just, just to be quiet, right? And there are 10 verses that I saw that speaks to this quietness. And, and look, look at this. Ecclesiastes 3.7, there's a time to tear, a time to mend, a time to be silent, and a time to speak, right? James encourages us that we are to be slow to speak and quick to listen. Be still and know, we know that. You know, Exodus 14.14, 14, Yahuwah will fight for you. You need only to be still. Wow. Psalm 37, be still before Yahuwah and wait patiently for him right? Psalm 62, oh my soul, wait in silence. You see that? Job, Job 6, 24, teach me and I will be silent, okay? So you see that when we are, when we learn how to silence our thoughts, there's something that happens, okay? Um, how do I put this? Um, we are so accustomed to being soulish. So what is soul? Soul is our mind, our, our, our intellect, our desire, our will. And we grew up in a very soulish society. So we're very soulish. We have to recognize that our thoughts are less than, in fact, Yahuwah's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Our ways are not his ways. So by being silent is us training or consciously realizing that hey is this my soul that i'm hearing right and keep going right i have um psalm 131 i have calmed and quieted my soul okay so all of these things look aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs wow so i put this pretty to me it's simple when we go to sleep right um, what happens is we lose consciousness. 
So we basically are not conscious of anything. So our soul, in a sense, is sleeping, right? Because the next thing you know, on your waking hour, you're all of a, all of a sudden, once again, you're conscious of time and what's happening, right? But when we're asleep, do you know that our spirit never really sleeps? So when we're, and there's a couple of scriptures that backs up this, and I, I, this just came to me, so I don't have it in front of us right now. But our spirit delights when we go to sleep because somewhere in the scripture says that that is when the Most High opens our ears and seals instructions to our spirit so that we don't become prideful. That's somewhere in Job and Psalms, somewhere. So the point is our spirit, there's a part of us that is always worshiping Yahuwah. There's a part of us that's always delighting in the law of the Most High. Okay, so where the battle is, is with our mind, with our soul. And so what I, my point is, this is why there is something to this being still and learning to be silent, learning how to be quick to listen rather than you know, satisfy the need to speak, okay? And that, because that, you know, I, I'm saying that uh, when it comes to the maturing process, I believe that there will come a time that we've matured so much in our walk, okay? That we will come to that place where we have been given the discernment and we can speak, Right, because it's somewhere else in the scripture, it says, don't worry about what you're going to say, right? The Ruach will bring to your mouth what to say, okay? So, and we see this exact same thing happening with Job because Job has three friends that sat in silence, okay? And yet, you got us, and this is, this is the interesting part, and yet they were, were um, deemed by Yahuwah to have fallen short of their advice to Job, okay? You can look into that yourself, but you're going to see now in the end when Job repents, right? The, the friends, Yahuwah is not happy with. And what Yahuwah says is interesting. Now, therefore, he says to them, to, to the friends, take for yourselves seven bulls and seven rams. Go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. Now, we got to understand, for us to understand what that is saying, we're going to need to go back in Leviticus and see what is this burnt offering. And we're going to get into a detailed study of that. But for now, we see that seven bulls and rams, that is huge. Um, they, these friends of Job's were not regular Job's. They were they were elders. These people were influential people. That's why the offering that's being requested of them is bulls and ramps, okay? So they're of, uh, you know, they're of prominence, right? Yeah, also, go ahead, they, sister. Weren't the, his friends kings? Oops, I'm not, yeah, thank you. There you go. You've probably, I didn't even look that far yet, sister, but if that's what you've stumbled upon, then I agree. I can just see from the offering that they are to present that they are of influential, right? And, but here's the key. They were being told by Yahuwah to do a burnt offering. So even though they sat in silence for seven days, which is a good thing, there was something that's lack. And you can see that in how they talk to Job. Um, and you can even look at that by studying their names. So if you look at each of their names and look at what it means, it speaks of their character, okay? Uh, you know, their purpose and their lack thereof of their purpose, their, their Yahuwah given purpose. But my point is the reason why they fell short gives, it, the clue is in the offering that Yahuwah is asking for them to do, which is a burnt offering. Now, burnt offering in Leviticus 1 is basically a total consumption offering. In other words, a complete surrender. So the friends of Job did, were offering advice, judgments over the matter that is still soulish, is my point. That is not of the Ruach, of the Neshama, of Yahuwah. 
It is not spirit led. This is why the, they have to make restitution. Yes, go ahead. But it sounds like uh, to me, I don't know when I read it, but it sounds like the the friends of Job were kind of harsh on Job. Like in the words they were, <laughs> yes. I don't know if that's what I'm getting from it. Um, well, yeah, maybe not they all were, the time, Absolutely. They were giving uh, judgments and uh, their advice or what they were looking for Job to do based on their, they weren't really discerning what was going on. So if you look yeah. at what they're saying. That's right. Yeah. They looked like they didn't discern, but they didn't discern exactly right. Yes, that's yeah. correct. So my point is we have to recognize the same thing with us. Okay. Um, we have to realize, okay, is what I'm about to, what I'm thinking about this matter, how I'm receiving this request, how I want to pray for this, is this in the spirit or is it in my soul? Okay. And this is why we got to, how do we then approach the tabernacle, you know, the approach the Yahuwah in prayer and worship with the burnt offering? Okay. So that's just something I want to throw out there. But like I said, Let's not underestimate the power of the counsel and understanding in the spirit of the Most High. Because in contrast to the three friends of Job that are supposed to be elders, right? There is this friend who is amazing. His name is Elihu, okay? Study him too. Elihu is a young guy, okay? And one of the things that, again, when, you're, when you study him, you're going to see that he was so respectful. He gave ample opportunity for job's friends to give their case okay he was so in fact he struggled with himself he's like oh do i say this do i say this or do i not but in the end he's like oh i'm burning i have to say something but if you look at elihu okay elihu precedes the most high in other words before yahuwah started talking to job he didn't even need any introduction he just went right to it right after Elihu had given his peace to Job, okay? But what's interesting is Elihu is going under the anointing of the Ruach HaKodesh, even though this man is young. And remember, again, the childlike faith, right? Consistent with this, this approach of childlike faith. He's talking about Job 32.8, it says, but there is a spirit in man, okay? That in Hebrew, that's ruach. And then, and the breath of the Almighty, that breath there is a neshama, okay? This is where we want to study deeply. And I know we've, we've talked about this, Sister Florence. Neshama is huge. We have to understand what that is. So the breath of the Almighty gives understanding. So, even to someone who is as young as Elihu, and he went in the anointing of the Ruach, and his advice, what his discernment and judgment was, he was able to show Job where he lacked, where he was fault with, where he was at fault at, right? Because we know that Job repented in the end, okay? We'll get to that when, I, I'd love to see what you guys come up with, like ladies come up with, um, because there's something that's amazing about what Elihu had placed, had uh, reminded Job where he was lacking, okay? So that's the first point, okay? Second point. Uh, in the study of the offerings, there's this idea of male and female in the offerings. I don't know if you guys noticed that, right? Like, uh, offer up a male of the flock, male goat or female goat. Like, you know, you guys, okay, what is that? Okay, so th this is an interesting thing, male and female. Okay, so male, let's start with this. Male in Hebrew is zakar. So zakar is to remember Okay, another deeper analogy of the word zakar is um, to do on one's behalf or to bring someone to mind and then act upon that person's behalf. That is huge right there. Okay, so just remember, male has to do with zakar, with remembering, with being in a full mental disposition that 
whatever it is that you're doing, someone else is acting on your behalf. And we know who that is. That's the most high. Okay. Female, on the other hand, is nakab. Okay. Nakab is interesting because it means to pierce, to perforate, to bore, or to appoint. Okay. What does that remind you of? To pierce, perforate, pour. Hmm. Right. So the word zakar is to remember. What is it that we have to remember? Is there something that we have forgotten? And what I'm saying is yes, okay? And the, the, the text for that is Jeremiah 1.5, okay? Jeremiah 1.5 says, before I formed you in the womb, okay? And that same word formed is the same exact, exact word that the creator used to form Adam, okay? Just so you know. And remember, he planted Adam in an enclosure. So think about this. Before I formed you in the womb, I yada you. I knew you. Okay. Before you were born, I set you apart and ordained you to be a prophet. Think about what that is saying. So even before Jeremiah was formed in the womb, Yahuwah is already saying, I've, we've had an intimate relationship. So my question is, how come, and it, you know, it's not just, this is not just prophet Jeremiah. This is the same true of us. Before we were formed and we are fearfully and wonderfully made, we had an intimate gnosis or knowledge or yada relationship with the most high. But why is it that we don't remember that is my question. Okay. And, and we see the same thing with being at play with Paul. Paul says in Galatians 1, 15, 16, when it pleased Yahuwah who separated me from my mother's womb. See, so he's recognized that he has a special calling, that he's been set apart from his mother's womb and called me through his grace. Look at this, to reveal his son in me. Look at that word in me. Okay, so what Paul is saying is that there's, there is this intimate relationship that I had, that I had with the Most High before I even was formed in my, in my mom's womb. But you know what? I'm now waiting for the revelation of this, of the truth, you know, his son from within. Look at that, in me. Okay, not without. So there is a, an intimate knowing that's from within, that is awakened from within. I love how um, Sister Ashley says it, like she says to unlock from within, <laughs> to be unlocked from within. That is exactly it. And can I and, ask you in terms yes. of, um, it, you know, being formed in our mother's womb, you know, is we're in that amniotic fluid, amniotic. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so we really are. Um, separated from from remembering and i think that that is a process of us returning back to the father is is in that remembrance but we have been I put love amnesia that input. i love that i don't i might i'm sorry I, I cut you off when you said amniotic and i think you said uh, that word is very close to amnesia is that what you said mm -hmm. exactly see hallelujah exactly <laughs> exactly wow you i never made it. that connection before wow yes. that's so awesome well it wasn't you know, this oh, was somebody else's connection that they had made that i just get to share with you guys absolutely and and some ancient text calls it the water of uh forgetfulness something like that the the rivers of forgetfulness but you're absolutely right that is why in the mother's womb we swim in amniotic fluid and guess what? I also learned somewhere else that, and I haven't quite studied deeply for me to really, but I'll just refer to it real quick, that when we pass, so when we go back to dust, a part of us goes back into that form again before we evaporate. Anyway, so it's like we go back to that form again. Very, and that's a really deep study right there, but point is, <laughs> I love it. Because it is in the remembering 
right? Because we've forgotten, because we all swam in that forgetfulness. It's in the remembering that really puts us in our anointing that we can preach, that we can declare among the Gentiles, right? Among the nations, the, the, the go, go, oh, I can't remember. But then this is what Paul says, and we, this is key to what I'm trying to say. He recognized, he says, but I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. And I should have continued that, and I didn't. But the, the rest, the thing that he says here is, nor did I go visit the apostles. But instead, I went to Arabia. You got to understand what he's saying there. He recognized that the anointing, right, that he is going to, he wants to be revealed in him to remember is not going to happen if he were to confer with flesh and blood. That is the soulish realm that is tied to the soulish realm. And he even recognized that, hey, if I go to the apostles, and these are seasoned uh, followers of the Most High, that, and, and we understand that there's a little bit of a squabble between Paul and someone else, I can't remember, was it Peter? But he's like, I'm not gonna let anything or anyone come in the way in having the Messiah, Messiah revealed in me. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to Arabia. And from my understanding, historically, that Arabia is the same place where Elijah was found or was ended up going to after his 40 days fasting at the cave, right? So in other words, there's this place where he completely went into unplugging from the world, right? And we know that Paul says that he was ministered to and taught by Mashiach himself, beautiful. So you see my point? There is a remembering that we have to recognize, okay? And Isaiah confirms this in Isaiah 26. He says, yes, in the way of your judgment, so Yahuwah, we have waited for you. See, again, there's this waiting period. We're so quick to want to jump. We're so quick to want to speak. But look, that's the flesh talking. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's why, I don't know if you picked it up, like, when somebody asks for me to pray, I always, I got to calm down and I got to, you know, and my prayer is always going to be the word of Yah. Okay. And we're going to, hopefully we'll touch on that. I don't know today, but there is a difference between praying in the, the known will of Yah. How do we pray when it comes to not knowing his will for a time being? So there's a difference. And Yahusha teaches us that. Okay, very, very interesting. But Isaiah 26 says that our souls have a desire though. The soul desires Yahuwah's name. And we're gonna study what that name is about because we're gonna get down to the ancient, even more ancient part of that, which you've probably heard other sisters say, Ahaya, right? We're gonna study that, okay? Because even in that, when somebody says, oh, this is the right name, I'm not just going to change everything. I want to wait for Yahuwah to speak to me when it comes to that. You know what I'm saying? Like, I want the, the revelation to come from within, not from the apostles, not from, you know what I'm saying? Not from flesh and blood. So we have, there's a waiting period. And look at this, for the remembrance of you. So our soul has a desire for Yah, for the most high's name and to remember him and so obviously we can only do that through the torah of him the torah of the most high that's why in psalms 19 it says the law of yahuwah is perfect and what does it do it converts the soul okay and it makes our testimony sure and it makes the wise or makes the simple wise okay so so what am I saying is that so there's when you see the word male in when we when we go into studying the the offerings in Leviticus, notice that male uh, flock has something to do with remembering, okay, and the female part has something to do with receiving, okay, with possessing, okay, because in Luke twenty one nineteen very powerful verse. It says, by your patience, 
possess your souls. Look at that word, sisters. By your patience, possess your souls. And if you look at the context of this, this has something to do with persecution, even from your own family members. And, and the, Yahusha puts this in at, at the end. He ends with that statement. And so what does possess mean in Greek? It's to acquire, to get, procure a thing for oneself to possess or to marry a wife. You see that? So it has something to do with the bride, with becoming the bride, like we are the bride of Mashiach, right? That there's something to do with the receiving, the receiving end, to be, to perforate, to bore, to carry, right? So we'll get back to that because there's more to that that we're going to touch on in a bit. But there is, I hope you see that there is a difference in spirit, soul, and body, and there's an importance in knowing the difference. Because Ephesians 6 says we are to pray in the spirit on all occasions. You see that? On all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. We are to pray in the spirit. Not, it doesn't say pray in the soul. Because when we pray in the soul, we fall short. <laughs> Even though we quiet for seven days, just like Job's friends did, they fell short. Because they did not completely surrender. Okay, but they did not surrender their own thoughts, their own ways. And we know that Ephesians 6 also paves the way to this famous verse where we see where we are to put on the whole armor of Yah, that the Yahuwah, that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And it tells us the types of armory that we are to put on. Powerful stuff, right? Okay, so there is a huge we have to understand the difference between spirit, soul, and body. And when we do that, we now will understand what Paul is referring to in 1 Corinthians 11 when it comes to head covering. Okay, very, very, we got a, the provision and the love and the protection of the Father in the order of or the authority of things. It's just so, it's so evident in 1 Corinthians 11. And even Paul talks about this in Romans 7 as well, the relationship between a, a woman and a husband. When you understand the difference between spirit and soul and body, you're going to understand what Paul talks about when he says, for the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives, right? But when the husband dies, she's released from the law of her husband. We got to understand what that is saying. Um, when the husband dies, she's released from the law of her husband. Um, and I think right away of what happened in the garden. You're going to notice I go back to the garden a lot because that's uh, somewhere in scripture. It says I'm going to reveal the end from the beginning, right? So we understand that this typology of death, even before um, the making of Eve, okay, before Eve or Hava was taken from Adam's side, look at Genesis 2.21. We see that Yahuwah, Elohim, caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. When we look at that on the surface, it looks like he just went to sleep because Yahuwah was doing an operation to him. But if you look at the Greek, okay, the Greek, the word Napal, uh, appears twice. Yahuwah is the one who caused, okay, to fall. Nepal means to fall, to lie, to be cast down, to fail, to fall, a violent death. Think about that. That is what Nepal or cause means, or to fall. Deep sleep means tardama. Tardama is used of unconscious, to fall into a heavy sleep. And we, we call that the soul sleep, like death, right? So, in the beginning, we see that there's already a clue to a typology here, okay? So a typology of Messiah is what I'm trying to say, okay? So, and, and why, okay? Um, we have to recognize that by knowing the difference between spirit, soul, body, we recognize that there is a war between the soul and the flesh that Paul speaks about, okay? In Romans 7.22, Paul touches on the spirit. In the spirit man, we delight in the Torah of Yahuwah. Okay, so 
there are we know a number of people who haven't awoken to the I, to the the need to obey Torah, okay? And that's because they're very soul heavy. But we have to recognize that there is an inner part of them. If they're made in the image of Yahuwah, there is the spirit within them that delights in the Torah of Yahuwah. Okay, it just hasn't been tapped into, it's been ignored, it's been shut closed, and that inner man needs to come out. It needs to come to the surface and do what it's designed to do, and that is to rule over the soul. And so the soul can rule over the body. That's how it works. Why does the soul need to rule over the body? And why does the spirit need to rule over the soul? Because Paul says, yet even though there's a part of us that delights in the law of Yah, Paul says, I see another law in my members. And this law is called the law of sin. It wars against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. You see, so there's a part of us, there is a part that is um, in captive to the law of sin. And this is why Yahusha came in the flesh, you see, to release us, to give us justification, just as if we did not sin. That kind of uh, newness, creation and newness in life, right? So there's a, a law, there's a war between the soul and the flesh, or we want to call it law between, sorry, war between the flesh and the spirit. And so guess who is in the middle? The middle of that is the soul, okay? And that is why Second Peter says, I warn you, dear friends, as temporary residents and foreigners, I love how this is in the New Living Translation, I think I put the... I love how he puts it because this is a good reminder that this is really not our home, right? And that's why there's a war going on because there is something that's coming. There is a city that's coming that's not made of hands, that's going to remove the very presence of sin, okay? So here it says to keep away, we're being warned while we're being temporary residents and foreigners to this earth, uh, to this world, we are to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against our very soul. So the point I'm saying is there is a war. There's a battle between spirit, okay, and flesh. And what the spirit wants is to marry or to be one with their soul. That's really what the idea of, um, you know, of, of the typology that Paul talks about when it comes to marriage, right? But then the flesh is also looking to take the soul captive, right? You see that here. So there is a, a, a war that is uh, against our soul, okay? Um, so more typology, okay, more typology. Paul, it's very important that we understand, um, you know, even, uh, I don't know if you agree with me, but I don't really see a lot of um, information or or teachings out there that really uh, breaks down the difference between spirit and soul. Okay, so I look at Paul. He's a great teacher. And remember what I said earlier, we learn by pictures. Okay, we all, when we were young, I don't know if you went to church, but I did, and you know, Sunday school materials is filled with the creation story with Adam and Eve and the pictures and the colors and the garden and things like that. And, and so my point is, Paul does the same thing, okay? And what we learned in the church is obviously very, very different from what we are now, but Paul uses the typology of Adam and Eve so we can understand our spirit and soul in a way like a child would in a picture form, in an imagery form. So Paul likens Adam as a type of Messiah. Romans 5.14, okay, he says, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned. According to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, that statement is huge. <laughs> in other words, Adam had a different type of transgression According, that, that's interesting. 
And then he says, who is, so this Adam, who is a type of him who was to come? Okay, that is, and okay, so let's just take Paul's writing on surface level for now, and then we're going to unpack that in a future study, okay? Paul writes somewhere else in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, again, being consistent with the typology of Adam. He's like, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. You see that? Why would Paul not use the name Mashiach or Yahusha? Why didn't he just say the first man, Adam, became a living soul and, you know, the last Mashiach is... So what I'm saying is Paul is purposefully doing that because he's using Adam as a typology so that we can under understand the difference between spirit and soul. And so we can learn how to pray in the spirit. And so that we can learn how to take authority in the spirit to cover our soul, right? To cover Eve, Hava, okay? So Hava, the woman, is a type of soul. And Timothy this time says that. Timothy says, Adam was not deceived, okay? We have to take this statement to a whole new level. Okay, because we are quick to blame Adam for the fall. Okay, it wasn't that he was deceived. That's what 1 Timothy is saying. So who was deceived was the woman. Okay, because the woman is a weaker vessel. Our soul is weak without the covering or the headship of the spirit. We have to recognize that. So being in a weaker vessel, she fell into transgression. And now you got to ask why First Timothy is saying, nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness and self-control. So are you saying that by giving birth, that's how I'm going to be saved? No, that's not what Timothy is saying. Okay, what Timothy is saying has to do with the fruit of the Spirit, right? The nine fruit of the Spirit. And he just sums it up here, faith, love, holiness, and self-control. But it also goes back to what we talked about earlier about female. So remember, female to pierce. So if you're looking at uh, Neshama, <laughs> yes, the soft shell in our governor. <laughs> That's right, stuff. So you got to look at spirit or Adam or the Neshama as the seed, okay? The seed for it to grow into a, uh, a tree or uh, a plant, whatever, it needs to be, uh, it needs to enter the soil. Just like how when we are bearing children, you know, in through intimacy of sexual intercourse, right, the seed is being implanted within us. So to pierce, and you also got to see that that piercing also has to do with Mashiach being pierced on the tree. You got to see that that is related. But my point is, okay, why is it that the soul is going to be saved by childbearing? What it is talking about is um, bearing the fruit of the spirit, okay? And we see that, and I'll show you a little bit more about that to tie it wow, to that. that, is, that is, yeah, that is amazing. I think it, it makes a lot of sense that that means bearing the fruits of the spirit. And, right. Wow. <laughs> Because we look at this, we got to ask the question, what, what does childbearing have to do with me being saved? You see, unless yeah, you... I always read right? that and I was like, what is that meaning? <laughs> exactly. exactly. That so so, do you see now why Paul and Timothy is using the story of Adam and Eve to understand who we are? Because we're made up of spirit, soul, and body, right? So we have to recognize that there's a part of us that is weak. That is uh, that could tend that could fall into deception, and so there's a part of us though that delights in the law of the Most High. There's a part of us that's connected to the Spirit of the Most High. That the, you know we are to our responsibility now is to minister to our soul. That's how it works. And and look at this, Second Corinthians. But I fear, this is Paul talking now. Lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Hava by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Mashiach. It's very simple. 
And Paul here is also using the same typology because our mind is connected with our soul. So again, he's using Eve as a type of our soul. And we got to be careful, right? That we don't get deceived into the craftiness of the serpent. And so really the call here is so that we are to be wiser than the serpent, but at the same time be harmless as doves. You see that? There's that interplay there, right? And this is what I was talking about in 1 Corinthians 11, this issue of head covering. I mean, there's definitely, yes, Ashley. Oh, beautiful. That is from the, the Pashita, from the Aramaic translation. Can you read that, sister? Yes, I'll just pull it up here. Um, oops. Um, for Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not seduced, but the woman was seduced and transgressed the command. Yet she will live by means of her children if they continue in faith and in love and being set apart and in wisdom. And I just mm -hmm. wanted to include the footnote. You know, a righteous woman raises her children up to perpetuate the Malkut Elohim, Therefore, she lives by means of her children. A woman who does not bear physical children can also raise up spiritual children. The KJV ah. in childbearing is very misleading. Hallelujah. Thank you for putting that forth. Awesome stuff. Do you see now? The yes. now I heard a lady's testimony that the, her child being her fruit. So I think it can be both. You know what I mean? Oh, I, like with it, it makes sense. Like it can be both. Like um, absolutely. She, had she said she heard from the Most High that her children were like the fruit that she had produced, uh, like her good fruit. And, absolutely. Right, but like, I don't have any children, and <laughs> I was like, what is this verse mean? What's this for? To be raising our children with the fruits of the spirit. I mean, they are the the physical manifestation of those. Fruits. Absolutely. Yes. Wow. Yes. That's good. Yeah. Everything starts in this in the in this physical, like the the physical first, earthly first, and then the spiritual. So for us to understand spiritual thing, we have to understand physical things. That's why Yahusha uses the natural things when he's teaching. Right. That's why his disciples, his apostle uses these concepts because we have no ability to comprehend spirit. OK, unless we glean from the natural things. OK, so it is the same thing when it comes to Second Corinthians, the issue of head covering. OK, you can look at that from a physical as well as a spiritual. And we know that a spiritual is way deeper and more real than the physical. So this is why it says, for this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol. That, that word symbol is not even there. It's just added by the King James translators. But for this reason, the woman ought to have authority on head, which is the covering of her husband, the covering. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's true. Exactly. The symbol, is, the word is in italic, so it means it's added, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly, it's added. And, you know, Ooh. Sister um, Ashley says the word seduced. We got we to gotta understand that what happened in the garden was not just the entire change, the entire fall happened because of eating of a fruit. There is so much more to that that has something to do that is sexual in nature, something to do with seduction. Okay, and that is why the there's the seed of uh, Adam the and the seed of the serpent. You got it. So there is something else in Yahuwah willing, we'll get there when we get there. But I think our purpose is to understand prayer or earnestly asking. Okay, so, so we need to do that because we need to recognize which one is the weaker part of us, which one is the soulish part of us that we just inherited from the world from how we were raised and which one of us that we need to surrender so that we can operate in spirit so we can be occupied and be moved by the spirit that is the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man that prevails much you know it is in that revealing mashiach in us okay and has nothing to do with flesh and blood okay so fifth idea asking double-mindedness okay so we understand and we speak highly of this 
but we really don't understand what this is saying and we need to recognize it more and more as to when and how and where we are becoming double-minded. Because when we are double-minded, we are unstable. That's what J James says, it's pretty, it makes sense, right? If we have a heart and brain incoherence, it actually causes more, uh, okay, okay. It causes havoc in our, in, our, in our brain, the way we work. This is physiologically true. If we're thinking one thing, but believing in our hearts something else, that is double-minded. You know, um, and this is why we gotta, we gotta, faith is what brings that strong conviction to support and amplify what we're thinking about. So when we're, we're quoting scripture, we really know what it's saying. We understand what it's saying. We're not just saying it because it's there or because someone else says it, okay? So look at this. James 4, 7 says, Therefore, submit to Yah, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to him, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, your, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So what I'm saying here, lament, mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the master, and he will lift you up. In this verses in James 4, 7 to 10, this is what happens in the tabernacle. <laughs> you got to see that everything here is so in James and the you know writer of Psalms, when they're writing these things, they have the tabernacle in mind. Do you see it? Do you see it, sisters? When we offer That's up awesome. our flesh, right? Mourn, weep, because we're offering up our flesh. We, you know, we got to cleanse our hands. We got to purify our hearts. Think of the anointing oil. Think of the, the joy of uh, oil of gladness, the, the joy of righteousness, the robes of righteousness. All these things are tabernacle language, like the imagery, right? And this is how we come near him. This is how we draw near to him. And this is how the devil will flee. Okay, this is how we become devil proof. If, if you know, so double mindedness, the mirror of flesh is the most high. <laughs> Absolutely, to bring to... Of it, it has... so... go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Sorry, sorry, I was just gonna say, afflict the soul. Oh, we missed, missed it again. Say, say it again, sister stuff. I was gonna say, like, with the to afflict the soul. Absolutely, yes. And that has to do with Isaiah 58, that fasting, right? Right? Now, I, here's another interesting thing. About that Go ahead. Four verse in terms of resisting the devil in terms of the tabernacle model is when we are inside that inner court, then we are separated and we are um, safe from the outside world and from the, the devils and the wild animals and so forth forth within the, the fencing of, of the tabernacle structure. So we can resist them by um, uh, escaping into the tabernacle, coming into that place of safety. Absolutely, absolutely. And then you know what else? And that is a powerful statement that you had just mentioned there. And same thing with Sister Stephanie, the afflicting of the soul. Because what happens is there's a process, the court, the court, uh, process seems to be a temporary thing. Okay, what do I mean by that? Because if you look in Revelation, it says that, you know what? It says, don't measure the outer court. Only measure the holy place and the holy of holy, something like that. Because the outer court is going to be given over to the Gentiles to be trotted upon, something like that. So remember we said earlier, enter thou into thy chambers. So my point is, this um, the, the courtyard experience is something that we're supposed to be doing here right now in preparation for the coming judgment because we are to be found in the holy place because the, in the holy place is when. That is the place where we're going to be able to sing that new song, that name that nobody else knows. It's such a beautiful um 
typology, a picture of uh, of of uh, what's the word being in in his protection. I, I can't even think of that, but you you got to understand that this is what we're supposed to be doing now is courtyard business because we have to learn how to get into the holy place and not only learn, apply it and abide in there. We're going to study that, what it means by Yahusha when he says, abide in me in John 15, 16 and 17. We're going to learn that, okay? And let me know if you want the reference to that revelation thing about the outer court that's going to be given over to the Gentiles for to be trod, trotted upon. But the idea here is double-mindedness, okay? Why do you think Yahusha in Mark 11 and elsewhere, the, the lesson of the withered fig tree? Okay, we in some uh, sages, they say that fig means excuses. Okay, so what happens when there's no more excuses, right? So remember what uh, they were just walking and the disciples saw what Yahusha did because he basically cursed the fig tree, you know, and the fig tree um, withered away so soon. And Yahusha says, assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you see that? you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. You see that? Anything, <laughs> whatever you ask. And there's more to this. This is just a portion. Whatever it is, whatever it is that you ask in earnest asking, is going to be given to you, but we got to stop with the excuses. Just like how Yahusha cursed or made the fig tree, the excuse, the tree of excuse, I guess, wither and never again to bear fruit. Right? That's what it says, the account. So I guess I guess we all in agreement here that we have to learn excuses, how to be done away with excuses, right? To be blame shifting, to be doing all this stuff. Again, all of this is soulish realm. We got to learn how to die to that. And so we can walk in the spirit, okay? Pray in the spirit or ask earnestly. Now, this other thing is very, very interesting. Asking earnestly or praying, right? <laughs> As servants versus friend of Yahuwah. Is there a difference? I want you to think about that. Servants versus friend of the most high. Well, there is, okay? John, John 15, 15. Look at what Mashiach says right here. No longer do I call you servants, okay? So I get, you got to understand that there's a, a progression here from servitude to friendship. Like, again, we're to draw near, yeah, right? So for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but... I have called you friends for all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. Okay. And look at this. Yeah, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. So this is an election in you. I've appointed you that you should go and bear fruit again, very consistent with the Malki Zadi call and that your fruit should remain. And whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Do you see how powerful that statement is? So if a servant versus a friend, okay, remember Abraham was called the friend of Yah. Uh, James 2.23 says, Abraham believed Yah and it was credited to him as righteousness as he was called Yahuwah's friend. Okay, and remember when he was about to rain fire and brimstone to Sodom and Gomorrah? And Abraham was asking him about, oh, what if there's 50? What if there's 40? You know, and then who was like, oh, should I, should I tell him what? Yeah, you know, should I tell him what I'm about to do? So do you see how there's this interrelationship? There's a difference when it comes to knowing the will of Yah versus not knowing the will of Yah. And that has to do with how near you draw to him is my point. Again, you got to look um, tabernacle. So 
what I mean by this is if you look at um, the story of Adam, okay? If you go to Adam, I'm just gonna show you this so you understand. Adam is a, a special set apart creation of the most high, like the person of Adam. He is the first Malki Zadik, okay? One thing that you, you, I want you to see here is the breath. When Yahuwah breathed the breath of life into him, that word nashama, okay? Nashama, okay, comes from a root word et etymology, nasam, which means to pant of a woman in travail or labor. Wow, look at that. And if you look at the Hebrew construct of this nasam, it has something to do with noon or seed, okay? And shem or name, okay? So it's been given to the, through the breath of the most high. It's, we have been given everything, the seed. We have been given the living water. We've been given the son of righteousness. We've been given the ruach. We've been given everything that we need so we can bear fruit, you see? But there is this work that needs to take place first, that panting, that laboring, okay? And, and you see the apostles talk about that, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Right? So, so point I'm saying is, look at this. Now you see why um, Yahuwah is talking about something about being appointed and that we sh are supposed to bear fruit, okay? Because again, going back to the creation story, after Adam was made, look at this word, Yahuwah Elohim planted a garden. That word planted, is nata in Hebrew, which is to, to plant, to fix, to establish, to establish. And then not only that, if you look at what it says further, it says in the gan or the enclosure, eastward in Eden or delight or adan, that's what it means, adan is adam, very close to Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed, so the word put, we don't want to just read over that. The word put is actually really interesting. It is the word sum or sum. And sum means to put, to place, to a point. You see that? To make, to make for, to transform into, to bring to pass. These are powerful words. Now, the, this root word sum, is also the same root word as the name, as Shem. You know, the name of Yahweh, Shem. Shem means name, right? So if you look at, if you pick the, just a Hebrew word name, I'll show you what I mean. So name, uh, where is it? Name, you see that? Shem, Sem, they changed it recently. It's interesting. You see how that's name, reputation, but the root word of that is Sum. Okay, so same idea. So we have been appointed, we have been elected, okay? You are elected when you are in that gan, that enclosure, that holy place, the tent. And then it says that you are to go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. The Greek word here is the same Greek word for the word abide. So really, King James just likes to play with us, but it's the same thing abide so your fruit abides and this is what it means this is how you ask whatever it is from the father in his name that he may give you right um and and i think this is the last one and i'll just you know questions and stuff like that but like really confidence and compassion in um in when we're when we're seeking earnestly is in the abiding and the bearing fruit, okay? And we actually will see that very clearly when we read John 15 very carefully. But I think I just showed you um, what I mean when I took you back to Genesis 2 and I showed you the neshama, okay? The breath of life breathed into Adam. 
And um, I don't know if you've done a study on uh, Neshama, Sister Ashley, but it is made up of four Hebrew letters. It's made up of Nun, Shin, Mem, Hey, and a very, very interesting on its own because Nun, as we know, is seed, is a picture of seed. Shin is a picture of teeth, right? So if you want to look at um, we're eating the seed or food for the food to be of any use to our bodies, for our food to be able to be converted to energy, it needs to be metabolized. It needs to be broken down. So you can see that in the construct of the breath of life, you know, Yahuwah has given us the ability to break down, right? The ability to uh, break down the seed of the word or the seed of the, so we can bear fruit of the spirit, right? And mem is living water and hay is ruach, energy. So it really is all connected. And the root word, as I said earlier, has to do with travailing or laboring. And, you know, and I already showed you all that stuff. Um, and um, so I know I said a lot, and I know you're going to need to process this, and I'm happy to share my notes to you. But I guess I just want to show you where we're going to go next time we meet, right? Is there a difference between praying um, when it comes to the known will of Yah and the unknown will of Yahuwah? Okay, what do I mean by that? When it comes to um, earnestly asking, I think it's a great, a wonderful idea to be studying how the author and finisher of our faith, Yahusha, asked the Father, don't you think? Let's study how he prayed, no? So this is where I want to go into next time. I want us to look at, is there a difference between the prayer in Matthew 6, when Yahusha entered the secret, this he advises us to enter into the closet or the secret uh, place. Enter into your closet, that's what he says. And then John 17 is a different type of prayer. And we can glean from both of the differences of these two prayers, again, how we are to pray. So, I'm, you know, there's a lot here that we'll, we won't cover until next time. All right, sisters, what do you think? Number seven there, I think that I. Are you still there? <laughs> that was amazing, Sister Suzanne. That was great. Thank you so much for, for this great uh, teaching that you did. This is what I do when I, when I, this is what happens. This is what immerses, meditate my mind. And I have to share it. I have to share it have to share it you know last night when we were talking about prayer do you have any idea how i was trying to contain myself mm, i'm not gonna say this is not my platform no 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 <laughs> i have it is i got to and what i what i want to do is i recorded this because i want to share this with this with sister linda and stuff like that because we're so quick right like you know even oh one more thing remember last night they were saying we have to pray as if uh to call those things that are not as if they were. Does that sound familiar to you? To yeah. call the things I've heard that, that are... a lot in the NAR, but I, I feel like this is a very like uh, there's a borderline to it, and maybe there's a an okay part, but there's also like a part that we can't. We got it's got to be the will of God, you know, the will of the Father. Absolutely. So I don't want to, you know, to declare something that for sure we can. It has to be aligned with the word, his word. It really has to be aligned. We don't make any mistake there, I guess. You got it. And all you got to do is look up the context of that. If you look at the context of that, I think that's in Romans. What it's saying there is describing Abraham. What did we just talk about? Abraham is a friend of Yahuwah. So in other words, Remember what we said? We, we saw that in John 15, that when you are a friend, a status, you're, you've reached that, that disposition of friend, he will make his will known to you. 
that's why you can say you can call those things that are as if they are, that are not as if they were this is my point we 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 like to echo um everyone else everything else that we've heard in the past but it's time for us to get back what is the scripture really saying and honestly that starts with being still we cannot know until we learn how to be still we cannot that is a requirement we got to cease our soul our mind and i can see you guys are doing such a good job of that right now <laughs> And I just want to share what came to mind um, also in terms of the, the last one of the last scriptures you put up in terms of, um, you know, praying in Yahushua's name. Uh, you know, I think that we have been taught that that's just ending our prayer and then we just pray in his name. But really, it does have everything to do with being in, in the holy place or the most holy place, you know, where where he is. That That is how we are praying in his name and in his authority, not just by calling this in, in his name. This is, you know, what I'm praying for you. Um. You are on to something. And that is a part of my notes that is that I haven't shared yet. My, because if we're going to understand this, we have to understand what is it? Why is it that the word says anything that you ask in my name will be granted? And you're absolutely right. It is way beyond pronunciation. It is way beyond the 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 spelling, the we have to understand that there's so much more there than meets the eye and again it goes back to um this is how we uh walk in the spirit we 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 have to learn how to do away flesh and blood we we do that well, exactly. regarding the name, i was uh one one time i was like oh really i was into this group that we're always saying like uh, Yahuwah instead of Yahweh and I was talking to another sister over the phone and I was like I really want to know because I want to say the, the really like the his real name you know and that night I remember having a dream and I saw it on a piece of paper it was Yahweh so that's why I say that but I mean I still ask for confirmation but you know I, I really saw that on a piece of paper so that <laughs> we will I mean, talk about so <laughs> yeah, that was funny. Learned, the way that I have learned it was um was Yahweh, which is how I pronounce it. But as I'm studying the Hebrew with the vowel pointings, it does look like Yahweh. Um, so um I'm really I'm super curious about that. Oh, there's a beautiful study upcoming ahead and and honestly. Again, the, what you're going to find, what I'm going to show you with what the Ruach has impressed in my heart is it's beyond how we pronounce it. Yeah, it's I beyond. believe so too. It really is. Because if you get down to, even if you look at the first instance of yod Hey wah Hey in Genesis 2, remember in Genesis 1, that name didn't appear. Or that Tetra, I can't even pronounce it, Tetra, whatever. It didn't even <laughs> pronounce it. Um, it appears in, 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 in creation of Adam, of the garden. And I'm also going to let the cat out of the hat, I guess. I also am in the position that the garden was made on day three. And if that doesn't, if you're familiar with that, if not, we'll talk about it another time. But the garden is set apart. It's special. So I want you to think on the third day, every time, all when you look at the scripture, the third day was when Mashiach resurrected. It's, there's a beautiful play. And you will see that the garden was made on day three. Just study it. There's a difference between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 creation. But there's a point to that. But going, I always like to go on tangent. That's irrelevant. But my point is, when you look at the word yod he wah he, um, it is definitely an old, an ancient letter or word. You got to look at the root of that. And the root is haya, okay? So the word haya is very interesting because when um, when Moses was getting ready to be sent out to be like an apostle to the Egypt, right? To be sent out, to be a shalak to them. Um, he's like, who do I tell them? Sent me, right? 
And okay, the Most High says, tell them I am that I am sent you. I am. So that word is a haya, 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 right? Haya, asha haya in the interlinear book, uh, book. But, but what am I saying? It's not just that. There's more to it because what does that mean then? I am. And then you're going to see that Mashiach says, I am, right? And then you're going to see that it has to do with what we talked about, that the seed that has to do with becoming, coming to pass, becoming. So in other words, in the context of Moshe, when Moshe was going to go to the children of Israel, it's basically, he's saying, Yahuwah is saying to him, tell them that I am going to be what they need me to be. And at the time, they needed him to be their redeemer, right? So think about that. I am that I am. What do you need me to be in this instant? What is it, right? And that is a beautiful play with intimacy with Yahuwah. Like we got to, and that's what I mean in, when we ended with confidence. You know, we have to have this confidence. And the confidence yeah, it, lies therein in our Mashiach. It reminds me also like that we are to be doers of the word, not only hearers, so that when we act in faith, <laughs> like, I think we, are, we are doers because we don't just, like it's not only in our mind, but not only in our, our soul, but we're like, we're acting in the spirit. We're manifesting. And so guess what? The word of, haya is verb, is an action word. Absolutely, you're on point. And you're going to see that haya, the action, is how we get to know the most high. We, we, this is all experiential. We, we, have, we have to experience him to know him. So that's why he says, I am that I am. You got to see, some people say that that's the first time the word I am was manifested. I happened to see something else before that if you look at abraham's account okay abraham was probably la di da di da in the garden somewhere i don't know what he was doing but then somewhere in genesis um i think 15 i can't remember but he says the word of yah came to abraham in a vision right and then the word of yah came again to him and then afterward the word became flesh because the word brought Abraham out to see the stars. You got to see it in the text. So literally, who, what did Abraham need? He needed, you know, that promise. That was the time when he was given the promise of the seed, right? Right? So the word, it started off as the word came to Abraham. And then you got to see that the word transformed into a physical a physical entity that brought him to the outside to see the stars. You got to see that. You got to read into the text. You know, you got to, the consistency. And I would even argue that that word I am was present as well in the garden. Because what did Eve need when she fell into, when she failed her test? She needed an atonement. She needed a, a means to, to restore her back, to become one. Like she needed covering. That's why they were given skins, garments of skin to cover, right? Beautiful story. Like it is, so that's what she needed. So that is the I am. But like you see in, in, in Yahuwah, in yod heh wah -Hey, you got to look at the root word. It's the same word, haya. It just needs to manifest when at the right time, at the right perfect time, to bring about a beautiful lesson of who Yahweh is, of who the Most High is, the great I am, right? So, yeah, so it's it's more than just a pronunciation. Because, you know, we got to learn how to be in unity. Why can't the body of Mashiach agree even in the pronunciation of the name? Think about that. Why can't we agree? <laughs> how can we manifest as a people to, to be the witness to the world when we can't even agree with how to say his name. That's sad. But you know, Yahuwah is more than just words. The word was, in the beginning was the word. The word was Yah and the word was with Yah, right? The word became flesh. So guess what? Sound 
is only something that you and I can hear because we're here on the earthly realm. But before the word, what makes up the words? Thoughts, right? If you think about it, everything that I tell you right now originated from a collection of thoughts that's going through my mind. So if you look at Yahusha, he is literally the word of Yah. So Yahuwah's thoughts, his mental state, mental disposition, and he wants to declare that so we can hear him. And then the, the word literally manifested into matter or mother or matter, <laughs> right? Light slowed down is matter. That's what it is, congealed light. Blood is slow down light. That's all it is. So that's why Yahusha is the quickening. He brings us back to that light state that we were at before. Right? I know. I, so he was saying that everything was alive in his, uh, uh, like uh, his dream of heaven, Brock. He said that even the matters in heaven were alive and they were glorifying uh, the father by their expression like when when they said the messiah was passing by a tree it would all like bend towards it and show its beautiful fruit and then like everything was alive even even, even like the the the, um, the walls of gold and uh, i don't know par pearls and precious stones they were all alive and they were just they, they were like it was an expression to glorify messiah oh. So it's all like our perception right now of the world is limited. If, if you look at a bee, a bee looks at a flower and we see it as yellow, a bee sees purple. Like we got to understand that there's more to life than the five physical senses that we're used to. And that's why Yahuwah willing, we got to learn how to activate the 12 senses that we have. We're so, we, we think it's just five senses. But there's seven other senses that we got to learn how to activate. And again, that has something to do with the menorah, right? And oh man, and what else? The scripture says that the trees clap, right? Um, like Sister Stephanie, silence has a sound. There's, there are things called infrasound, sound that we cannot detect with our human ears, right? <laughs> right. There's an actual sound of silence. Yeah, <clears throat> like um, uh, Brad's, is it Brad Scott that does the, the teaching of um, equipping the beast? Equi equipping the image of the beast, yes. There we go, yeah, equipping the image of the beast. That is just profound in so many ways. And it's We're gonna just study so that too. true. <laughs> oh, man. There's a song that's called um, The Disturbed, and the, the, the song actually sound of silence and you actually dig deep into <clears throat> it's secular music you know it's heavy rock or whatever but if you actually dig deep into um the lyrics and that's another thing that, you know like, all my life for me i mean growing up like not within the word and you know not in a godly uh foundation um mm -hmm. you know i i subjected myself to secular music and and you don't really think about what is being said over you and what's what you're placing yourself in um, when, when this music is taking place, you know, and it's just it's so crazy because, you know, we get these catchy tones, right? These catchy little um choruses, if you will, these these lyrics, you know, we, we just sing the choruses. We just it's very mm -hmm. catchy. We're running down the down the street and we're just singing the the little um, sayings that they say, and we don't. We're just so oblivious to what is actually being speak it, spoken over to our bodies. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And it the, there's an actual sound of silence there. It's mm -hmm. a subliminal, subliminal message that's being said um, to your inner self. Absolutely. Yeah, it's spells. There's just they're putting spells on us to uh, music, and also in German, it's uh, they have this expression. I was once told by my German friend that if you like in the, uh, if you have this song that that just doesn't stop playing in your mind, it's called an earworm in German. We don't have this expression in English, but it's like a 
like a parasite in <laughs> your war. They have wow. that expression for that. <laughs> then you can't get the song out. <laughs> and I would say that the, the sound of silence is probably, I mean, just as you were speaking to before, how essential it is for us to be able to, to tap into our spirit, which is why the adversary has just flooded us with so much stimulus, why people are so uncomfortable when there is silence. So we just have to speak vain words just so that there isn't silence. Um, so the enemy wow. has an amazing job. To That's rob us. Yeah, there's, yeah, exactly. There's complacency in silence, right? <clears throat> because many times we think that, you know, if, say, you know, we've been in a meeting, a board meeting all day or whatever, you know, and all we want to do is just sit and just be, have our uh, five minutes of quiet. What are we thinking upon, you know, in that five minutes? Are we thinking upon like what was just spoken about in the meeting? What do we have to do the next week? Like, what are we thinking about? Are we reaching and connecting to the Father so that He can download in us <clears throat> those magnificent things that speaks louder than what's actually playing in front of us in our ears? Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. The enemy has hijacked what is like what you're saying has stimulus um because the enemy knows a lot than we do and um sound and light actually is a byproduct of it's something that electromagnetic frequencies carry right so electromagnetic that type of frequency wave and vibration it carries light and sound it actually also is what controls our DNA. You know, if you want to look at the science term morphogenetic is you get the word morphogenetic, right? Like, look at that, right? So point is, that's why when you watch the movie Matrix, you know, Morpheus is one of the characters there, right? So point is, there is, there is something about the, the sound. And we know that SA-10 was, the like the covering cherub once right and he was in charge he was given such pipes that he was in charge of worship at one point and that's why we we don't want to underestimate his you know his ways i mean but that's why you and he said, controls the music industry like everybody oh, yeah. that makes it like this very successful levels are all i heard they're all they have all like sold or sold it's really it's sad that it, it, the world that is the music in the world is totally controlled by Satan. All we do is we take it back. You know, we take it back because it belongs to us to in, to begin with. We've been given that now. We've been chosen. Yeah, been, we, we are set apart. We're not part of the apart. world. <laughs> no, we, we are in the world. Set apart. And that's why I believe the new song has something to do with that you know, a refresh, the new in Hebrew, I forget what it means, but it's uh, what it is in Hebrew, but it's refresh to be renewed. And song in Hebrew, wow. like new song is journey. This is a journey that we need to renew. Check it out. Look, look at new song and what it means in Hebrew. So it's not just singing is my point. Like, like I said, like when the, the, the church, the pastors on the pulpits, they don't realize this when they go to to cemetery school, or sorry, seminary school. Seminary, <laughs> seminary school, right? I should make fun because my brother went to one. But um, but I, but uh, the point is, I kid you not, my brother went to one, and he shared one time. He's like, they were literally taught how to be dramatic when they're doing a preaching. They're like, okay, oh, yes, this is yes, yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Point being is they don't know this. Uh, the way they are preaching, the, the manner in which they the diction, the diction that they use, the mannerism, that actually goes back to programming. It is a type of programming. So you will see a lot of people, you know, genuinely loving dear people that see the truth. They know you can talk to them about it, but they can never get out of the church. They can never you know to a point where they can't it's it's and that well, is the form of process i guess totally they, they, they their their subconscious and also their 
I think their emotional side because they will talk, they will, it, they're like, uh, it's how to uh, entertain. So people yeah. love to be entertained, right? So they're just, those teachers are trained in how to really like grasp the attention of people and really. Oh yeah, yeah. like like movie seats. And that's why yeah. they also have the the praise music to to elicit this emotionalism that you think is you know of the spirit to to get you in that trance state so that then you're ready to receive whatever the preacher is preaching from the pulpit. Exactly. But it is all yeah. the stuff. Exactly. It and was scary it. that when I I just listened to something yesterday on Bethel music. It was really like what they did on last Easter. Did you see that? Wow, it is like, it looks like a satanic ritual. It's, it's, I was like, wow, this is scary. I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, check that out. The Bethel Easter service of uh, music, something like that. It, it's just like, it's just unbelievable. It's what powers it up is the intent that goes behind the music. Yes, that's right. Intent is so powerful because intent is electricity, right? And then, you know, your emotion is magnetism. So when you compare, when you combine both, you, it's an electric, electrical or electric magnetic field. It, it creates this exactly what, our, what, what powers up, what protects the earth from uh radiation from space and all that harmful frequencies is because there's an electromagnetic thing that surrounds the earth like we are that's why i say our heart is basically you know if you take the h and you move it to the n heart it becomes earth doesn't it so it's like a macro and micro comparison right and yahusha wants to rule over our hearts so you're gonna see in the menorah Number four makes an interesting, the middle part of the menorah makes it all of a sudden an interesting stage or a part of the menorah because it's is really it in, in Yahweh's spirit or something like that. The middle well, part, I, I can't I remember what you had in the middle part. Yeah, that is the spirit, the spirit of Yahweh, and then it, it and then it branches oh. off like six. So if you look four. Four times three is 12. You got to look at the numbers. And I, we're also going to look at the numbers. Six, six times two is what? Is 12, right? So the 12 and then 12 times two is 24. 12 times 12 is 44, 144. It's all related is my point. But we got we to gotta understand why. And I'm going to share my, and I'm sure you'll have downloads. I'm sure you guys will see things too. It's like, you know, so this is what we're going to talk about kind of things. <laughs> All right. Do you want me to share my notes with you? Or is it, um, is the recording enough? The recording is enough for now, but I will let you know if I need more. Okay. Let me know if you need a link or something. Um, but uh, I, I honestly, I have so much. Yeah. We, 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 I, yeah, there's, there's details here if you've ever wanted to um, can like uh, an article or something that I pulled up and so what else so yeah so you know the the 40 day fasting and prayer um, is, is something that I put out on on YouTube right and um, you know I you know it's brother James he might be interested into it right so it's not a call to literally fast is what I'm trying to explain to Sister Florence, right? We're not all going to, it's not the way you understand fasting, right? So what I was, what I was wanting to, what my, the, my heart's desire is to talk why 40 days is important. That's all, right? That, that's why. And then we leave it up to the Ruach, should you want to enter into that, right? So, you know, that's all. To me, I just want to study it together because there is definitely this preparation that is key. Yeah, key for us to, to uh, understand. So I don't know, Sister Florence, do you, do you, do you know what, did, what feedback are you getting from are you? Because James from, is like- From what exactly the teaching you, you did today? 
No, from um, the 40 day video. Oh, I loved it. it I, I just, uh, you brought up some scriptures that I just hadn't thought about. What was it? And I really loved it. Yeah, I was like, wow. Yeah, the like one, the still small voice scripture. one, right? Sorry? The still small voice one? The Elijah one, I like that. The beginning yeah, part. The one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there so, was many yeah. that were really Oh, there's, really blood. Cool. there's plenty there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we leave it to the Ruach. And I know I sense the love for the word from you, sisters. So I just want to share that. These are my thoughts on, especially after last night. I'm like, ah, oh, I got to share my what I'm learning about prayer. I got to share it. You know, I, I've been, the Ruach's been speaking to me on this for a while now. I'm just waiting for the right time to share it. Right? So hopefully we discern, we, we understand how, right? So any, anything else, questions or anything? Well, I love how you said that, you know, uh, the prayer that you, I guess you also imagine, like you use your imagination. So could it's, you explain further on that? That was a really good, yeah. Well, before I, before the, circular tabernacle <laughs> i would imagine the shoebox model <laughs> right so um literally you know how that there's that uh courtyard the covering the the white linen cover or not linen it's um it's uh it's not linen it's flat no what is it it's flask right no no it the term leaves me. is it sackcloth no no, no. The, I thought it was wool. Wool, thank you. Wool. Yes, there we go. Um, so that speaks of Mashiach, right? That speaks of he is the flesh. He is the word became flesh. So you enter through the gate. There's only one gate. There's only one way, right? So yes. you enter through him, through your Mashiach. Yes. Right. So, you know, there, there is the Yahusha came and offered himself as a living sacrifice and he did that outside the court so that's you know that is the entrance in other words that is our entrance to the court to enter through the gates um and then you enter through your gates once you're in the court you're no longer standing in your own righteousness you've crossed over from darkness into or you're crossed over from your own standing into yahusha's righteousness right and so with that there's the um you got to take off your shoes right you got to wash because in the court they're all wearing they're all bare feet right they're all bare feet and then there's a, a brazen the wash basin the basin wash right you wash your hands and feet with that and then there's the brazen altar right so what do you do with that you know that is where it, it has the all-consuming fire it's, the responsibility of the priest is for that fire to never go off so it's always on day and night so that's a picture of um when we surrender something comes to mind uh maybe you know, the, the ruach uh impresses something upon our hearts that we need to repent to we have access to that brazen altar all the time we can repent all the time it doesn't matter we don't have to wait shabbat we don't have to wait a certain time we can do that all the time um the take the cutting of the the animals right the parts the skinning the the live the kidneys what does that signify all that stuff so my point is when i go in there when i enter into the court first of all i'm thankful you know there's a thanksgiving aspect because you've been able to enter through the gates so you're entering the gates with thanksgiving with first thing yeah. just like you know anything like when you buy a ticket to wonderland or whatever aren't you oh i'm thankful first of all that you're able to afford it that you can actually purchase it and now you have entrance so your you know gratitude is however you oh, express yes. that smiling yeah. whatever say thank you to your you know it's dad so, mom, thank you, <laughs> so you enter right and then there's this aspect of putting off putting on there's this aspect of uh surrendering Remember our hearts, we cannot renew hearts. So hearts need to die, needs to be recreated. Yeah. It's like you, you crucify the flesh and yeah. then you are 
you are in this new identity with the Messiah. Absolutely. You take on his identity. So everything Absolutely. that the Messiah has been, like his eulogy, how did you, how did you say that? Everything that the Father blessed Messiah, every mm -hmm. blessing that the, has, we have access to it through when mm -hmm. we die, like in the waters of baptism, and we are raised up in his, uh, like we have the mind that is in the same mind that was in Messiah is also in us. So we become one. Yeah. Behold, we are a new creation. All things are passed away. I mean, exactly. things, the new creation. all things become new, right? Yeah. And so there's that aspect, the putting on, putting off. There's the putting off, putting on of robes of joy, robes of righteousness, oil of gladness. You see all of that. What I'm saying is you're going to, when you read Psalms, it's going to make you so put much off the Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And not only that, the skin and the legs and stuff, you take it out. You it, take it out of the court garbage right so the flesh and blood the nations right? of yeah. images in yeah. your mind someone said yeah. that it was really good <laughs> you know the right. the vain imagination that we have we cast them mm -hmm. down yes so we, yeah our, our heart is so wicked uh desperately wicked that who can know it so it, it needs to be done away with and needs to be right. creating me a clean heart and what's interesting is it says renew a right spirit within me yes so energy cannot be destroyed or cannot be created so there's an aspect of us that's eternal and that is the spirit the energy so that's why you can only renew it right renewable energy or whatever right you you sh you you it could be it could be soiled it could be it could be ignored it could be in captive you know it could be you know you know what i mean so this is how this is what goes on in my mind and when i'm praying that's how i do it and then and then once i take care of business out there right and then you got to ask too if there is there anything you got to ask the ruach is there anything that is you know you shine the light of the ruach in you is there anything that i don't know about you know anything shine your light in me see and search if there's any wicked ways in me right you got to see that that's the ruach's job so now um, because you made the ask, you can expect that the Ruach will tell you if there is any. And the Ruach, she will, you know, will bring that to light through a conversation, through a YouTube feed. I don't know, but somehow the Ruach will bring it to your attention. And then you can repent of it. And then you can be restored. You can replace it with the truth of the scripture, whatever it is. And then now you have this, this, this ability you're not gonna, you know, you can enter in his righteousness, you know, in Yahusha, in the holy place. And what is in the holy place? It's the table of showbread. It's the menorah. It's, get this, it's the altar, the incense altar. So think about this for a second, and I'll, I'll end with this, right? We pray for, we have requests, right? We have our supplications, our requests. Are we praying from the outer court is my question. Because we really should be when we are, when we're bringing before him, you know, the, our, our requests, our, our supplications, we really should be in the holy place. Because just think about it, it doesn't make sense. Like that means there's a reason why there's a, there's a division, right? There's, right? So you gotta take care of business first. And, and this is all in scripture, you know, I, somewhere it says, I will, if you regard sin in your heart, I will not hear you, right? Somewhere. So in other words, but the, the point is we, we've been given everything. The provision is there. We just need yes, to. Yes, that's it. right. That is so true. Yeah. We need to use it, right? It's there. But then for us to know what's there, we have to study it. <laughs> and so, and this is what we're doing. You know, he engrafted a uh, word that is able to save our souls. Is that the verse? Uh, yeah, the... Uh, yeah, like our the desire of our souls. Oh, so it's um, um, let the engrafted. What is it? I'll try to find the verse. Okay, I think I got it. <laughs> I love your you 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 have your blue light blockers. Wherefore. Yeah, she doesn't. 
Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. Hallelujah. Wow. It's uh, James 120, uh, 121. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. So when you read the scripture and you have the tabernacle in mind, and you have the spirit, soul, and body in the typology of Adam and Eve, it's going to come to life. Like I'm telling you, like it's going to come to life. If you are interested in knowing what the, the Ruach has shown me to try to express in different frames, you would, you know, there's, there's only one truth, right? But there's, there's many ways to express them or, you know, to, to display them in different framings, I guess, if you want to call it. But I, I, in my YouTube, there's a playlist there and it's, it talks about Adam and Eve, the triune nature, why it needs to be in harmony. What is Eve? What is spirit? What is Adam? Like, and they're like short videos, you know? So they're not, and they're, I, I did it in a way, not like this. I just, I did it in a, what is it stuff? It's like a tutorial kind of way. <laughs> like picture, just my voice and pictures and, and scriptures. So it's, I mean, to just, you know, so, and, and you got to see that when I was putting that together, it's like the Ruach puts this thing in my heart and then I have to sit down and have to write it. I have to, and then I have to write it and then I have to put the images together. So this is not something that, you know, I just sort of, this I believe is Ruach. So please, if, if you want to watch and understand where I'm coming from, why am I, why am I saying spirit, soul, and body is Adam, Eve, and who do you think the flesh is, the type of flesh? Right? You got it? I don't know. So, yeah, there you go. And now you're going to see Goliath, David, Solomon. Goliath is a type of flesh, right? Da David means beloved. It's a type of spirit. Solomon, soul of a man. Right? Same thing with soul. Look at the soulish people. You got to see what is, what is the difference between them. Right? So all these things come to light. Why do you think the scripture says there's three friends of Job? Why three? Now you got to see three. Right? Is that, does that signify something? Does that, you know, what is number three on the third day? Why is all these questions? So why are there three friends of Yahuwah, the closest to Yahusha? Remember, uh, Peter, James, John. Why is there three? You got to, you see, there, there is. And so, so that is, um, my point is when, when I started to see that, all I'm saying is started to come. Yeah. Sorry? Is, it, is, it, is there a connection with mind, body, and soul? Absolutely. Yes. 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 John, the beloved. Why, why didn't he, why did he, the, the promise of the Mashiach was for him to die of an old age. Why did James was the first one after Stephen that was martyred? Why Peter had issue with his soul? Many? Peter. Right? And all these things, well, it just comes to life. That's all I'm saying. So we, we, we've been told we are to, the word is quick and powerful. Hebrews, the, the word of Yah is quick and powerful unto the dividing of spirit and soul, bone and marrow, thoughts and intent of the heart. We are to rightly handle or rightly manage the word. So you, all these things, I, I guess I'm, what I'm saying is all this revelation I'm seeing in the word started off with understanding spirit, soul, body. So all this thing, this is not just me. This is now I, I see the scripture from a different light, especially the tabernacle. Tabernacle has three parts. Remember, outer court, holy place, and holy of holies, right? Then how come there was a point in time 
where now there's a tent, no longer a tabernacle. The tabernacle is Mish, Mishkan, right? Mishkan. Why is it that the tent of David, O hell of David, so tent of the beloved, and he was able to go in there? The Ark of the Covenant was in there? And he's not a priest. I mean, he's not a Levite. He's not an Arab. He's not from Levi. He, he's, he's from Judah, right? So how come he's able to do that? How come Psalms 91 was prayed in David's tent where the Ark of the Covenant is in there? How come, I, what I'm saying is how come there was a division? Then how come there's no division? So the, the Mishkan has three parts, but the tent, is one think about that is one and you're in that and you're praying psalm 91 he who abides in the shadow of the most high right or am i ab abides in the shadow of the almighty he who dwells in the secret place of the most high abides in the shadow of the almighty and then you're able to pray you know a thousand will fall on my side ten thousand will fall on one side that that thing will not enter my 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 dwelling place like you gotta see Psalm 91. How why is it prayed with such confidence and power? Because there's this ikadness happening there. No more division is my point. So in the tabernacle, if you really look at it, it's, it's really like the Holy Spirit speaking through him. Exactly. Exactly. The tabernacle, as beautifully detailed as it was, you know, Sister Ashley, it's plan B of yeah. That was plan B. Wait, the temple. The, the tabernacle. The plan A was Yahuwah wanting to tabernacle with them. So the, the building of the tabernacle was because of their disobedience. So now well, he they, can't. They were, afraid to, to, they were afraid to see the face of the um, Father. I think in the, the Mount Sinai, they told Moses yeah. to. That oh, yeah, they, they were. In the intercessor for them. Yeah, they, they, they disobeyed, and then th there's no. Right, they were right. fearing him. Point is, they were supposed to be a kingdom of priests. They were supposed to be a kingdom of priests. Oh yeah. But they became a kingdom with a priest. That's a that's different. That's true. So <laughs> wow. Well, this really gives me a different perspective of what you're sharing with how he how he is the the I am I am whoever you need me to be the people were like oh we want an intercessor we don't want you to dwell inside of us so then he's wow. like all right well then I'm going to create this tabernacle so that I will be wow. to, to then in have good eat on your on your behalf wow yay awesome. hallelujah <laughs> also what just come to my mind is those who have kept me as an um, arm's link, I also will keep them at an arm's link. That is so good, yeah. Zephaniah. Yes. I know. I said that one time. That's what I told you, Sister Sun, in one, one podcast we were doing. I said, Brandon said this really good uh, thing in one of his podcasts. And so it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yes. You see? Oh, wow. The power of i am wow that is really good ash and that's that's actually very good sisters that's wow that 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 adds to the layers of um revelation that and, the father and like, like you were doing yeah like actually you said like they wanted him more more far away so that's what they got exactly <laughs> they I'm wanted a video wow, wow. That's awesome. Yeah, you see, because it was a test, right? It's all it's yes. all about it being a test, right? So he is already, he is so big and magnificent and powerful that he has already tried and tested the heart to know where you're at. But unfortunately for the, the person, they don't understand that because they don't have the knowledge of Yahuwah. So they, they don't understand the knowledge between what he thinks and what they think. Hallelujah. Oh, that just reminds me exactly when you said about the testing was what happened to Eve. You know, the father was really, you know, was teaching her, maturing her. And then there was a point in time where now let's see if you're going to return the love that I've been showing you through the testing. So the testing, right, to see whether you 
love me or not. And then there's, there's a, the aspect of verse that comes with that. So what happened to Eve was, was a test to see what would happen. And then the test also reveals her need of a savior, her need of, to be a recipient of mercy. And we all should learn from that. We all, you know, and wow, that is. For me, I think about, I think that purposely that like how Adam was not with Eve when she was tested. Why? Because she's being tested. Mm-hmm. Right? <laughs> exactly. You got it. Oh, wow. Okay, Why yeah. was he not there? You got it. Listen, Adam loves Eve so much that just like what Moshe did, right? When the children of Israelites messed up, Yahweh was like, all right, let me start over with you. Moshe's yeah. like, no, block me out if you have to. What do you think Adam did when her, his bride messed up? You know, Yahuwah could have, all right, Adam, let's start over again, get you another wife. But no, Adam's like, no, I want to join her in her prediction, predicament, whatever it is. So he descended. He you know, he joined her. He partook, just like our Mashiach. We don't understand when the scripture somewhere says, Yahusha became sin for us. Think about that. You know, he was made a little lower than the angels, so he can, you know, be like us, flesh and blood, you know, to part to be able to partake, taste death. Like all these things, right? Someone also to- compared the the like the crucifixion to the Messiah paying the dowry for his bride. I was mm. like, wow, I never thought mm. about that. But that was like, wow, like redeeming his bride. Wow. He's paying a dowry for his bride. I was like, oh, wow, that is so wow. deep. Because you know, there's on. this law that you have to pay a dowry for, I think, for a bride in the Old Testament, like in the Torah, it talks about that. And then someone brought that up. I was like, wow. Like it's, <laughs> It's symbolic of that, and I, I think it makes a lot of sense, right? Like it, it is. It makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, somewhere in Psalms it says, "Mercy and truth purges iniquity." Think about that. Oh, so, mercy, truth purges mercy iniquity. Purges iniquity. So, think about who started oh, iniquity. Yeah, who started? Where did iniquity start? It was in the third heaven somewhere with Mm Satan. That was when iniquity was birthed. It was because of, you know, the five I wills that he did, right? So think about that. And Satan was a covering cherub. Okay. In other words, if you look at the Hebrew of that, he was a mashiach. Read it. Okay. So he, the level of influence as Satan did, brought with him a third of the messengers, a third. So it was a big mess, right? Big rebellion. So what Yahusha decided, what Yahuwah decided to do was to create Adam. You know, someone who is lower than the angels. Think, think about that. Like, and now through Adam and Eve, they both will exemplify mercy and truth. Adam represents truth because the Most High gave the commandment directly to Adam. There was no uh, text proof that says, you know, the commandments were given to Eve. No, it was through Adam. So Adam, his job was to teach the woman the Torah, the commandment of Yah. Okay, so for truth to manifest, mercy has to be received. So then that's where Eve comes in. She's the recipient of mercy beautiful and through mercy and truth right iniquity is purged think about that and then there's many other there's somewhere else it says mercy and truth uh righteousness is established mercy and truth the throne is established so this malki zadik priesthood has huge hugely have to do with mercy and truth we have to understand that because we are our spirit and soul is also in the same way, is my point. There's a part of us that delights in the law of Yah, right? The truth of Yah. But then there's a part of us that's weak, that needs to be converted by the law of 
Yahuwah, you know, so we can remember who we are. So it's like, it's a beautiful play. Yeah. No, I just had this thought. It's interesting that, that like, the, like the humans had a, a plan of salvation provided, but uh, a Satan, he doesn't, like, he, he's a cre creation of the Most High that just had not, didn't give this, this opportunity for, yeah, there's, I just had that thought. That's a really good thought. And I sort of stumbled upon that in a bit. You remember a Satan, he also was a Malki Zadik. He was a priest. Okay. He was given nine stones. You look at Isaiah, mm -hmm. nine stones. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Adam was only given, if you think about it, gold, bedellium, and uh, onyx, I think. Okay. So he started with three stones, or you can say gold as the breastplate and then two stones, whatever, three. So if you add nine plus three, what is it? Twelve, <laughs> isn't it? Twelve. <laughs> so what's the point? What does twelve represent? Twelve represents perfect governance. So you know what? I don't know whether SA10 was demoted. I don't know why, but he there was a part of him. He may have been near, he was close to the most high. He has he's been privy to multi-dimensional, omni-dimensional, you know, universe. I don't know if you want to call it. So wasn't it like, the spirit of jealousy? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's an yeah, yeah. Dumb, yeah. Sure. For sure. He wanted to but steal the job that was not available in God. Exactly. <laughs> well, what I'm saying is he had nine stones. Because remember, we're, we're, there's a, um, the stones as well is also going to be mentioned in Revelation. And in Revelation, there's 12, right? So point is, even, even though he was so close to the Most High, he was the covering cherub, there was still an aspect of a Satan that wasn't complete, right? And he was, the way I see it is that he was supposed to know that uh, by obedience as well and mercy. Um, but he didn't, he failed at that. And I'm, I'm just, I can't remember exactly my notes now, but, but what I'm trying to say is even though he was so close to the most high, there's still a, a part of him that needs to be complete. And he failed at completing that. Right. And so now you, who was going to show the angels, what he, what a, a lower, like Adam can do, who is a lesser being, if you think about it with just three stones. How it can be completed to 12 is my point. So there's this, right. and exactly, Stephanie, Satan was jealous of Adam. That's why he found a way. Wait, I just had a small little epiphany. Like weeks, weeks, maybe a month back, you had spoken about um, the movie The Fifth Stone, right? And what just came to my mind is a part in the movie where he, um, the Argogs or whatever the whatever the dimension they are, they come to Earth to take the stones. Um, so what was said is, what am I going to do with three stones? Hmm. Right? Hmm. <laughs> it just made me think of that. I was like, wow, wait a minute, three stones? Is that the three stones we're talking about right now? What? What movie was this, Stephanie? The Fifth Element. Oh, the fifth element. I've, I didn't even know that. Really? Oh, wow. Yeah. That's interesting. But that's interesting. That is interesting for sure. The fifth element. Wow. I, I think when, when you look at the fifth dimension, I think that is the dimension of, I, I've heard other people say that that's where the, the, the people, the, the angelic beings are hanging out. The ones that have, you know, been kicked out. I don't know, that, but that yeah. Well, well, the New Age always talked about like going into all these dimensions, especially if you want to climb high up there. And I think they talk a lot about the yeah the the, the fifth dimension, but they go they go into higher uh, dimensions. So it's I don't know what they're trying I to tie. That's it. Call it. <laughs> We're not authorized to go. We're not authorized to go in that dimension at all. Yeah. 
um, our authority is given. Astral projection, they're really, they get really Absol possessed. Yeah, oh, very yeah. scary. Oh, yeah. very Astral scary. projection. So when Yahusha, um, when Yahusha's blood was spilt on the ground and he released water and spirit, that was for this dimension. That was where our authority is. That's why somewhere in John it says, Yahusha came not just by water, but by water, blood, and spirit. So, you know, the three things that Yahusha released on earth is our authority. That's why we can plead the blood. We can apply the blood. You know, we can pray in the spirit, right? We have the living water. This is all. But when we go into the fifth dimension without the covering, without being allowed there, that's not good. Mind you, there are people that have been brought into a, 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 a third heaven, it seems, that they were given special vision and revelation, like John, right? Like uh, like Enoch, like uh, uh, Paul, it seems, you know, like, but all these people, they were there um, by permission. So we don't, we shouldn't be, like you're saying, the astral projecting thing, that is, you know. And also like, um, one time I, I just met this person and um, I don't want to go into details because I, I want to respect privacy and all that, but it's just like, I was trying to find a, a deliverance ministry because uh, of her story it was really intense when she had uh, been attacked and all that. And I came across a ministry, but what I found out later is like, uh, they were asking to be paid for deliverance and all that. Like the coach, there was a big whole thing on it. But they were t talking about that they were going through, through I think, what was it called? A dimension or something like that. And they were battling with the, the Satan and his fallen angels. <laughs> and after that, I was like, wow. Because <laughs> I, I was trying to help my friend get the, like a deliverance ministry. I think for I know her. who you're talking that, that about. Like, you know what I'm talking about? I think so. And I think, yeah, this person, um, it is interesting. Yeah, are we talking about said, the same person? I, I don't know if I can mention the name or not, but he's, he, after that, I was like, wow. You know, scary. a part of, he actually, if, if we are talking about the same person, he. Is it what it is? Is it a D? Is D? it a D? Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> two Ds, I think. His last D's name D's has a D. D's oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, we are talking about the same person. You know I what's used to interesting? Want the book from a friend, that, that man, yeah. You know what's interesting? You shall know them by their fruit, right? Okay. Uh -huh. So what's interesting about this ministry? He he does have a powerful intercessory prayer ministry. I I got, and and he is actually skilled at, and I gotta give them give this to him. He's very skilled at dealing with uh, people who have suffered dissociative identity disorders. That I'm is not sure because I tried. I had I met a person that had the, you know, uh, well, I, I'm not gonna go on recording telling that, but it's it's really yeah. like like it's already satanic ritual abuse, and I was trying and he was um, no like he the, and he had coaches. Of, he was not available first of all, and he had other coaches, but like. And she went with that, but she had to pay all the time and she would never get a deliverance. Like it was always like, like more, more schedule. And at one point, I think, I think that he, he gave her a few more hours. Like she had, uh, but he said next time that she would have to pay again. And I just felt like that's just not biblical, you know? Like, you know, you can give, like you can give, yes, if you, if your heart, but just Absolutely. Like, I, I yeah. just didn't feel it after that. I was like, no, that's that's weird. And that somewhere it says uh, we we give freely because we receive free. Yeah, somewhere. exactly, exactly. But you know what? You shall know them by their fruit. So now he's talking about he really doesn't like the Hebrew. He like keeping the Torah. He doesn't like it. He thinks it's uh, so. That's how I know he's not. You know, he he he's against it. He, he thinks it's, you know, he, you know, you know, you know what it is when they're, they don't believe in, you know, they, they yeah, don't want. But he, what he was going into was really, um, it sounded really appalled. Like I've, I've listened to his podcast yeah. a bit to try to get to know him because I was referring him to, and after a while I was like, I don't know, there's something, I can't remember exactly everything you've talked about, but it was really like, 
it wasn't it, it wasn't biblical you know it was extra lots of extra you know, you know what he started off okay he was actually he was good at the beginning something happened to him and i oh, think yeah, what I think he, okay yeah I, I i i knew of him when he was just starting when he was young okay. girl, before marriage so but the, the okay. point is I think what he was tapping into, because remember, he's going in there in the fifth, in the other dimension. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All kinds of dimension I think there. He's tapped into a different source that is mm. now uh, influencing him. Scary. But all I'm saying is he didn't start off like that. He was actually pretty okay. good before. He was very good. <laughs> Ashley and Stephen's like, okay. <laughs> but anyway, it's. It's such a blessing for me. This is like a four, 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 four plex. I was going to say double portion blessing, but there's four of us. So double, double, <laughs> double, double. Or what is it? Quadruple? Quadruple. <laughs> oh. I couldn't think of, of the quadruple word. I was like four plex? No. <laughs> oh, and Sister Stephanie, just so you know, I, I you didn't hear me say earlier, but when you were telling me about what Brandon does, for like as a loan officer that's actually what i do too <laughs> no I, way shut the front door i've been a mortgage i've been in the mortgages for like hundreds of years but like but i've recently when when i heard strongly the need like the for the the call of yahuwah to minister in this manner like just awakening you know sisters and i i purposefully uh, took a part time. So so now I'm working three times a week. Sometimes I wish it <laughs> versus full time. But but point is, um, I was gonna say before I even was able to do this, Yahuwah has gone before us. So when he when he called us to move away from the city, we um, found ourselves in a better financially position because we sold the home there for much more bought a home here for much less and so we're dealing with very little mortgage you know and yahoo willing absolutely be free from that and that to me it's that's all it is because to me the more freer i am the freer i am to you know to to be in fellowship with you sisters so, so that's how i see it so it's like you know i've been blessed just like you know like you're saying why i'm getting this for free i want to give for free you know what i'm saying like this I I didn't register to have whatever. Everything that I'm seeing is through the guiding and leading of the ruach. Like, I mean, yeah, the ruach has used many many people, but you know, to learn how to tap and tap into that one still still small voice is something that we all have to learn how to do for the days coming. That is very <laughs> true, and that is easier said than done most days. <laughs> Very true, Stephanie. It's, so it, and real quick, I had I had to laugh because I, I'm <laughs> what you said about what you something what had happened to him. Well, <laughs> you said before marriage, and I just had a chuckle because a marriage happened to him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, the influence of that other girl. But anyway. <laughs> but uh, but the, or or vice versa, right? But, um, what was I going to say? But to be honest, though, it was a double thing for me because I, I'm, I'm dealing with mortgages. You got to understand the word mortgage, how it's broken down, right? You got to understand more. In French, law means death. Yes, death. Yeah. So mortgage, you, you have a contract for death, for life. So... I, I, it sounds so morbid. <laughs> mortgage. <I know. laughs> that sounds <laughs> really morbid. I know. I, I used to be involved direct, but now I can sort of because now I'm support. I'm just support. Like I can do what I do with my eyes closed. So that's why when I'm working, I'm listening. <laughs> I'm doing things. Wow. Like yeah. So Brandon, he actually works in refinance. So he's a loan officer. He <laughs> he. Comes